Hello, and welcome to today's workshop, The Six Pillars of Digital Campaigns with Dan Gretsch. This is the eighth session of the Riverview Credit Union Mid-Ohio Valley Entrepreneurship Expo at Marietta College. As we get started, I would first like to take a moment to thank this year's Mid-Ohio Valley Entrepreneurship Expo title sponsor, the Riverview Credit Union, as well as our in-kind platinum sponsor, Clutch MOV, our gold sponsors, the Swindeman Agency and McDonough Foundation, our silver sponsors, Premier Bank and Tech Growth Ohio, and our bronze sponsors, Trademark Solutions and Tenney and & Associates. Next, I would like to share that the ninth session of the Riverview Credit Union Mid-Ohio Valley Entrepreneurship Expo will be on Thursday, March 11th at 4.30 p.m. The March 11th event is round one of the PioBiz competition entitled Problem Solution. We invite community members to attend and hear from Marietta College students participating in the competition as they introduce their product or service and describe how it solves a problem better than other products or services currently on the marketplace. Attendees will also have a chance to vote for their favorite product or service. For today's, for today's session, I would like to remind attendees that our online webinar has both a chat button and a Q&A button. The chat button is for you to use to respond to the questions Dan asks you. The Q&A button is for you to use to ask Dan questions. Finally, I would like to introduce myself and today's presenter. My name is Heather Miller. I'm an adjunct faculty member here at Marietta College, and I'm assisting in the entrepreneurship program this spring. I am joined by today's presenter, Dan Gretsch. Dan is the founder and CEO of BizHack Academy, which trains small business owners around the world in the BizHack leading building system. Dan has worked as the head of digital marketing at two software startups and the nation's largest Hispanic-owned energy company. Before becoming a business storyteller, Dan spent two decades as a journalist. He has also taught at top universities, including Princeton, Columbia, and University of Miami. Dan is a graduate of Princeton University and has two master's degrees in storytelling and Spanish language journalism. He's a dual citizen of the US and Spain. He's a father of two. His wife, Gretchen Biesing, is the CEO of Catalyst Miami, and he was part of an improv comedy troupe for more than a decade. Welcome, Dan. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Can you hear me okay, Heather? Yes, thank you. Perfect. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now and we'll get started. Um, we have a great crowd here today, guys. Um, I want to point out that we have a chat. Uh, I'm going to be giving you prompts and asking you to uh, by the way, while I'm doing this little preamble, Heather, if you don't mind launching the first um, poll, um, guys, when, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the Q&A, um, and Heather will be monitoring that and alerting to me uh, at, 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 if there are any questions that she'd like me to address. Um, you can also use the chat for more feedback because it's an interactive session, so use the chat to interact, uh, answer prompts and so forth, and the Q&A for questions. Uh, and Heather will uh, manage that for me. In the meantime, um, please answer uh, the two poll questions, if you will. Uh, the first one is about um, what, wh who you are. Are you a business owner, a student, an aspiring entrepreneur? And then the second is just to get a little bit more information about whether you've uh, ever launched an ad campaign on Facebook or Google. Um, so uh, Heather, how, how are we doing with responses? We have the majority of people, but still a few outstanding. Would you like to see what the results are? Yes, please. All right. All right. So what I'm seeing is that uh, a little bit less than half of you are college student or faculty of Marietta College, which is great. Uh, eight of you are business owners, um, and a number of you are aspiring entrepreneurs, professionals who work with entrepreneurs or employed in the public or private sector, you work for someone else. Um, I'll make sure uh, to uh, address the, the 
the college student and faculty audience as well as the, the business owner and professional audience in this presentation. And uh, more than half of you have never run a, an ad online. Uh, that's uh, pretty much par for the course and to be expected. Uh, and those of you who have run an ad online um, have, uh, most of you have done it with Facebook, a handful of you have done it uh, with Google as well. Um, th this is very typical uh, of what we see in our audiences, which is uh, for many of you, um, online advertising is really kind of a new frontier. Uh, so thank you for sharing and, and we'll get started now, but that's really, really useful information for me to help, help me understand um, what's going on. Um, and then Heather, um, I'm going to invite you to just, uh, I'll have you monitor the Q&A uh, and just interrupt me as questions come in that are relevant to the topic. Uh, I don't mind at all. Um, you know, I have 10 years of improv experience, uh, so I'm, I'm happy to, to take questions as they come. Uh, and I'll also, uh, what I'll do is after each, each lesson, I'll prompt you for any questions. So I'll, I'll do my lesson and then I'll prompt you at the end and you can ask me anything that's in there or if there's nothing, uh, we can move on. So uh, just, to correct, just a quick correction, I'll do, I'll do the lesson and then we'll do a little Q&A after each section. Um, so you should now see my screen. Uh, Heather, can you confirm that you can see it? Yes. All right, good. All right, so we'll get started now. So today we're going to talk about the six pillars of digital campaigns, which are part of what BizHack calls the lead building system. This is a systematic approach for generating leads for your business. Um, what is a lead? A lead is a contact. It's the, a person's email address and phone number. It's a prospective customer. That's what we in marketing speak call a lead. So today we're going to talk about the six pillars of all lead generation efforts for a business, and then the lead building system, which is a systematic proven approach for any business, B2B, B2C, B2G, large or small, to actually go about finding their ideal customer online and getting them to raise their hand and say, I wanna do business with you. Um, a little bit more about me, I am a business storyteller. I spent um, more than 15 years uh, with uh, NPR, PBS, The Washington Post, Miami Herald. Uh, what I specialize in is business storytelling. Uh, I was also the head of a billion dollar energy company and I grew um, several startups, including a B2B software as a service company from pre-revenue to an exit within two years. I'm a Princeton undergrad, an FIU master's and a Fulbright scholar. Um, I'm going to take a second now and stop sharing my screen because I'd like for you uh, to, in the chat, let's practice using the chat, I'd like you to do a very quick introduction of yourself. I just want you to say, I am, and then give yourself like a kind of catchy phrase. Uh, and then once you've done that, um, talk, you can get, tell me the name of your business. Uh, please take a second now and practice your business storytelling skills. And make sure that when you put it in, put panelists and attendees so everybody can see you. So far, I have, oh, there it is, Landon, the first one. Thank you, Landon Santini. You have won the prize for being awesome, thank you. Uh, just uh, so you guys know, it's hard to be up here when we don't see you or hear from you. So it's really important uh, to know that you're out there, you're listening, you're paying attention, you're not multitasking. So thank you, Landon, and you're welcome. <laughs> uh, Kristen Gessel said, I'm an, education, an educator of future health professionals. I love that. Let's get at least a couple more. I'd like to see who else is out there. I know it's late in the day, so uh, everybody has to put a little bit of extra effort in. There you are, Rachel, thank you. Um, Steve Parks, Rachel's a freshman. Uh, welcome in marketing and communications. Uh, Steve Parks is a community developer uh, in Ritchie County. Uh, we have a freelance writer, Kathleen Demartue. Uh, sorry if I uh, botched that. Brian Roach is a marketing business owner uh, and a graduate of Marietta. Uh, we have a marketing and digital media manner, manager for a hotel. That's Seth. Great to have you here, Seth. 
Mary crafts messages to raise funds for parks, a fundraiser. Uh, as you heard, my wife is a CEO of a nonprofit, and I spent more than half my career working in nonprofits. So Mary, if there's anything that I talk about that you want to help have me apply specifically to the nonprofit space, you let me know. Uh, Nat is a, mo a marketer focused on industrial industries and obsessed with data and structure. Love it. Um, Sakute, Sahakute is um, a petroleum engineering student from Cameroon. Uh, apologies for uh, brutalizing your name. Allison is a visual artist. Abigail is a digital marketing specialist for a marketing agency. Abigail, I'd love to hear a little bit more about who your ideal clients are and what kind of work, what kind of marketing you do on their behalf. Uh, Rachel teaches life skills to teenagers in camp settings. Uh, Tony is a director for a veteran national veterans nonprofit. Jack is a serial entrepreneur. Claire is a student staff supervisor. Uh, Courtney is a Marietta native uh, with a full-time position at the college. Excellent, guys. Thank you. It's really important that this be interactive, that you and I be in a conversation. Uh, I know we can't be uh, together today, which would be ideal, but this is kind of a little bit closer. And I'm going to be asking you continually to get in the chat and, 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 and give me your feedback and give me your input that will uh, make this session far more rich for all of us. All right. So, um, and thank you, uh, Lester and Keita as well for sharing. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again. So what are we here to do today? The first is we're going to talk about the lead building system. This is a systematic approach to generating new business online for your business. Um, it, it applies to any business, large or small. So it's a great framework for thinking about the um, business. We're going to offer you case studies of the LBS in action. And we're going to provide you a very clear roadmap of how to get started with selling to strangers online. I hope that sounds good to y'all. Uh, and we're going to now get started. So the challenge that many of you face is that small businesses are limited in time, money, and expertise. This is the hardest case in all of marketing. You don't have the money to hire someone really proven to do this for you. Your, your budget is relatively limited, and so your pickings can often be relatively slim. You often don't have the time to do it yourself or learn how to do it yourself. And your expertise is limited because most business owners uh, are, as they say in the e-myth, technicians rather than marketers or uh, entrepreneurs. A, a lot of you know how to do the thing that you do. So for instance, if you are a baker, you start a bakery. I am an educator, I start in a school. Uh, a lot of us are not marketers by trade and therefore marketing is something we need to learn, kind of like how to read a financial statement. Very few accountants actually start their own businesses. Mostly uh, the people who start businesses are the people who do the thing that the business provides and then they have to learn the accounting and learn the marketing on the back end. So. One of the sets of questions we often hear from business owners is who to hire, how to measure success, where in the world to start. And the reason why it's really hard to know where to start is because if you look at this graphic from Gartner, one of the leading think tanks uh, for businesses, you can see that Gartner uh, has mapped the actual complexity of digital marketing. So if you think Digital marketing seems complex and you're not sure where to start. I get it. I felt that way. I've been in your shoes. And if you look at this graphic, you can understand why you might feel that way. That graphic is, is, has no center, really. You know, the, the digital marketing hub that you see there at the bottom, that doesn't really help you in terms of where to get started. Do you start, therefore, with site retargeting? No. What is site retargeting? So, so this is the problem that a lot of the business owners that we work with face is they just don't know where to get started, who to trust, who to hire, how to even measure success. They don't even know what success looks like, let alone how to measure it. So what business owners really need is a trusted partner, a proven system, and then implementation support. So once they are, it's clear um, where to start then actually getting started and getting your hand held as you get started is critical. 
Um, and there are lots of folks out there who provide this to business owners, and BizHack is one of those trusted partners. We're very proud of the more than a thousand businesses that we've worked with to do this exact thing. And the system that we use, which is goal, the goal is for it to be as universally applicable as possible, as systematic as possible, and as easy to understand as possible, is called the lead building system. It has six pillars, a foundation, and nine steps. And we're going to go over those today. We've built this system from the ground up. This lead building is built from the ground up have, after having worked with, uh, it's actually near, near a thousand businesses, both Fortune 500 companies and many, many small businesses like Ascendant Studios, uh, which was in uh, is, which is a small dance studio in, near Miami, Florida, uh, that has actually been highlighted uh, in national ad campaigns for Google and Facebook since they actually worked with BizHack and got their marketing on track. Um, they're a small dance studio owned by a husband and wife, and they're very typical of the kind of businesses that we typically work with. So what is the lead building system? The foundation is your why. That's your business story. A lot of you guys kind of began to tell me your business story in the chat when you introduced yourself. But what we talk about when we talk about the business story is what is your deeply personal motivation for starting your business or if you work for someone else for working in the business where you work. So if you're an educator, why are you an educator? And what we have found is that a lot of times these stories have deep roots in our history, that we uh, often uh, work in, in jobs that harken back to lessons that we learned in our childhood. So we work through discovery to help understand why people run the business, why they do what they do. And once you have a clear understanding of why you do what you do, what your business story is, what your core values are, that becomes the solid foundation for your business and for your marketing. If you don't understand your business story and you don't know how to tell it, you cannot effectively market yourself. Once you've figured out your business story, there are six pillars for every digital campaign. In fact, this is true of any marketing campaign, whether it's digital or non, whether it's a flyer, uh, a billboard on the highway, a truck um, that you've uh, you know, covered in your own advertising, uh, a Facebook ad, you need to have a campaign objective, a target audience, an irresistible offer, a thumb-stopping video, compelling message, and a call to action. And I'm going to go over each of these in detail and show you examples of these in action. Now that you understand the framework, the strategic framework for doing this, what you need to do next is you need to actually put this into action. And we recommend you start by running a simple, low-cost Facebook ad campaign, and there's a nine-step process to implementing the, the, the six pillars and the foundation into your campaign. We call this the nine-step process, and it really boils down to running an ad and then running another ad. Uh, and this is really what our paid programs do is we take business owners and we run them through this nine step process using the framework of the lead building system to guide them through that process. Once you've done this for a Facebook ad, you've run through the nine steps for a Facebook ad, you can then wash, rinse, repeat and apply this to any marketing campaign that you might want to run. This is, it's a lot of work. And a lot of folks basically have a spray and pray or throw spaghetti against the wall sort of approach to their marketing, which is why many of you do not have success because there's a ton of thought and a ton of planning for what happens before, during, and after a campaign. And if you don't put in that work, you're very unlikely to get success. And if you expect success overnight without this kind of pre-planning, your expectations are rarely going to be met. This is how the big boys do it. This is how the Fortune 500 companies market. This is how you know, marketing departments with multi-million dollar a month budgets market. But we've boiled it down to its essence. We've made it as basic and simple as possible. And this is the approach that we now educate hundreds of small businesses on how to do and, and often with really fabulous results. So in 2019, we trained 112 small businesses on this process. 
They spent a total of $17,000 in ads and made more than half a million dollars in incremental revenue. That's a 29 to 1 return on ad spend. This is, these are extraordinary results, as anyone in marketing can tell you, and these are results that business owners themselves were able to achieve by following a simple process. One of the lessons in this is that nobody knows a business better than the business owner, and so if they're given the tools and a simple process to follow, they can have extraordinary results, and this is over the course of just five weeks. So a lot of these folks, um, not only did this course, the, the, the program pay for itself, but a lot of these folks were able to take this and build on it into the future. So that's the, the promise. That's the power of this system. And what I'm going to go through is exactly what the system is. And I hope all of you apply this in your own businesses. Use this systematic approach because you will get results. And you don't necessarily need someone to help you do that. You can do this on your own. Many people do very successfully. It's really just a matter of knowing what things to worry about. A lot of times people will come to me and they'll say, how often should I post on Instagram? And then I say to them, okay, have you ever generated a lead from Instagram? They say, well, no, but I get lots of followers and likes. I said, well, does that translate to your bottom line? They say, no. I said, do you see a path to how that could translate to your bottom line? They say, no. I say, do you have all the time in the world? Because what are you doing? Why are you spending time on activities that will not translate to revenue ever for you? And they, they stop and they think, and then they say, well, what should I do? And I say, well, why don't you use Instagram as a lead generating mechanism for you? And let's talk about how you can do that. And that's, that's the kind of shift in thinking I'm trying to encourage is for small business owners, especially where you're really limited on time and money, you need to be really thoughtful about how you spend your time online. I'm gonna pause now for a second and invite folks. I don't see too many questions, um, but is there anything in the chat that we wanted to review or does anybody have any questions that they wanted to ask about the framework um, and what uh, the framework can be used for uh, before I continue to actually dig into the details? Heather, I don't see anything. Is there anything coming in? There is nothing in right now. Okay. I am going to drop the link for the application and scholarship if anyone right. is interested in following up on that after your presentation. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, guys, if you have any questions or even comments, now's a great time to do it. Uh, otherwise, we'll move on. So I'm going to give you guys a couple examples of businesses that have uh, really used a more systematic approach to their marketing and had a lot of success. So uh, in the home services space, Mosquito Joe is a pest control company based here in uh, Miami, uh, which is where I'm based. They spent um, $1,100 in ads while they were going through the nine-step process, and they generated a little bit uh, over $1,000 in revenue. And you'll look at that and you'll say, well... They made less than they spent, and that's absolutely true. In fact, a lot of times when you're running ads, the initial revenue that you generate uh, is not, does not meet your ad spend. And a lot of beginning marketers say, oh, this was a failure. This was not a success. Well, it turns out that what Yoel at Mosquito Joe sells is a subscription product. The average subscriber lasts, uh, uses his service for six months. And so even though the initial revenue for the first treatment was $1,000, the projected revenue based on averages for what they've seen in the past was $30,000. And suddenly you take a campaign that was underwater and now it's having a 30 to one return on investment. That's an important lesson, which is you don't look at the first sale, you look at the lifetime value of a customer when you're determining whether a campaign is working or not. The lifetime value of a customer is what is the likely net income that you're gonna make, the profit you're gonna make off of a customer over the entire lifetime that they do business with you. So you, you take how much revenue you'll get from them, you subtract out the cost of providing them the good or service, and that's their lifetime value. And that is what sets your marketing budget not the first sale. If you sell a low cost product, let's say like a bar of soap, but you expect that the average person who buys that bar of soap will keep coming back repetitively, 
that gives you more of a marketing budget. And the idea is that you're trading dollars today in advertising for longer term sustained revenue. And you're going to spend $1 now to make $30 over the course of the next six months. That's what uh, you will. Uh, that's the exchange that you all made. And any business owner worth their salt would make that change, would make that exchange. Another example are educators. So this is actually a school based in San Jorge, uh, the San Jorge School, which is based in Mexico, Tijuana, Mexico. They use this technique to triple their enrollment over year over year. Um, and that generated over the course of the eight years of enrollment of their average student, more than $1.4 million in additional tuition. Dollar, tuition. <coughs> the numbers are huge, but if you think about it, every new enrollment can have a massive long-term impact for the business. So uh, it's really an extraordinary uh, return. And here's yet another example. This is a, a, a personal services business, in this case, health, wellness, a dental office. Um, what I found really, found really compelling about this example is that Angela used uh, uh, Facebook bot advertising um, to um, basically have a automated set of conversations with people who messaged her using Facebook Messenger. And in that way, she was able to qualify people. So the first question they said is, do you prefer English or Spanish? Uh, she's based in Miami. Um, and so perhaps not surprisingly, uh, a lot of people preferred Spanish. And then it asked them, you know, what service are you looking for? Um, you know, are you looking for teeth whitening? Are you looking for other kind of dental services? And they then knew how to best respond and to qualify the lead. She spent a little bit under $3,000 in ads uh, and made $150,000 in revenue in a matter of weeks. And she also generated a tremendous number of referrals where people were inviting their friends to participate as well. I see we have a couple questions. Uh, uh, so uh, moving on, um, I wanted to share um, this uh, quick video with you, which is actually uh, of um, Angela's father, uh, who came to a graduation and talked a little bit about, uh, you know, the power of this kind of the system on his business. Yeah, we've done TV, we've done radio, we've wanted to be in that chapter. I'm looking for business everywhere. I'm like a little radar looking for, for business for my company. Because I got employees and I like to go on vacation and I like to, I got to pay the rent. So anyways, um, so we took this course. This has been a game changer for my business. I mean, look into it. You guys have uh, just finished the course. Keep on pounding it because it is out there. And the funny thing is that None of your competitors, none of your competitors is doing anything like this. So go jump on it because I don't want to keep putting money into it. You, know, you get my return up, right? <laughs> exactly. so, so I highly recommend it. I'm very excited about it. I, I told oh my daughter, look, I want to go to the graduation. I want to go to the graduation. Because I'm so, I'm so uh, grateful. And, and thank you very much, Dan. I, I love you, brother. <laughs> I love this uh, video. It makes me smile every time I see it. It also makes me, frankly, a little bit wistful uh, for uh, the days of when we could have in-person graduations like that. I'm sure all the educators uh, miss that. All right, so let's talk about that foundation. We talked about the foundation, the pillars, and the steps. So the foundation is your business story. Uh, you may or may not know this, but IBM has a person who reports directly to the CEO that they call their chief storyteller. His name is Lewis Richardson. I have one degree of remove from him on LinkedIn. I've never had the guts to actually uh, contact him. But what um, Lewis Richardson says is that with Watson being such a magical technology, IBM, one of the largest B2B companies, you know, tech companies in the world, is now in the business of stories. No longer is it about selling things. But it's not just IBM, a classic B2B company. You have Microsoft, who sells software, GE, SAP. Nike, in fact, hired their first chief storytelling officer in the 1990s. They sell shoes. So whether you're a, a selling consumer products like shoes, selling software like Microsoft, selling B2B services like IBM or GE or SAP, 
storytelling is essential to it's a core function of the business and all of them have elevated chief storytellers to the head of their office so my question for you and please answer in the chat is what the heck is a chief storyteller so go ahead and in the chat please give me your guesses as to what a chief storyteller is and does Make sure to hit panelists and attendees so everybody can see your responses. So it's your best salesman and visionary, says, um, says Brian. Andrea Kirby says, someone who focuses on the purpose impact of the product or service. Someone who shares customer success stories, challenges overcome, that's Kathleen. Mary says, shares the impact of the product. Uh, that's imp particularly important uh, if you're a nonprofit. Stacy says, brings the product or service to life. Excellent, guys. Who is the chief storyteller of your company? Who is the chief storyteller of your company? Landon said, the chief storyteller is someone who tells the greater public the story of the company's origins, why it does what it does, who it helps, and why. You, as the business owner, are your company's chief storyteller. You as an employee for the company should become, should see yourself, put yourself in the owner's shoes. You should see yourself as a chief storyteller because everything you do in business is about storytelling. Leading is about storytelling. Simon Sinek, who talks about the power of why, that's a storytelling uh, methodology. Raising capital from banks or investors is storytelling. The three C's of capital, C for character. Character is about story. You as the business owner, are you trustworthy? Are you going to p make sure this business f succeeds no matter what? Are you going to pay the bank back? That is storytelling. That is character. Raising capital from investors. The number one thing they look at is the team. Does the team have a track record? Do I believe that they can actually accomplish their vision? Sales is storytelling. Telling the stories of customers and customer successes and, and also the, the reason that the business uh, does what it does, its values. And then, of course, advertising and marketing is storytelling. Business is storytelling, and you, all of you, no matter what role you play, are the chief storyteller. So we talk about the business story, and it's the foundation of your marketing. Um, and the we call the communications diamond your business story. So I'm holding a fist. This is a diamond. You can see right now that I have a ring and that ring, it's from my alma mater, Princeton, is shines depending on what angle you look at it. So the core of a diamond is rock solid and it never changes. But depending on what angle you look, you may or may not see a certain facet of that diamond. That is a very powerful metaphor for marketing. You have your core business story, which is why you do what you do, it's your core values. They do not change. They're true yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But then depending on who you're talking to, whether it's a sales prospect or a customer or somebody who you'd like to hire, you show a different facet of your business. And that's really what it's all about, is marketing is about showing different aspects of your business story depending on who the audience is. So if you have that solid foundation, then you can use Instagram or your website or LinkedIn or a flyer or your signage on your store to then tell that message of your business story. But if you don't know your business story cold, you cannot be successful as a business. You cannot be successful as a marketer. So how do you figure out your business story? Well, we have an exercise that we use called the why chain, which is where you sit together and you ask yourselves why you ask you ask the business owner why do you do what you do and and why is that important to you and was there someone in your life who uh taught you to value those things and these are the reason this this why chain exercise um is really critical to unlocking the power uh of your business story and to discovering that business story, the core purpose, the why you do what you do. Simon Sinek, who's really popularized this idea, says that people 
don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. And he's put that into a TED Talk. He's put it into a book. And he's created something called the Golden Circle, which is you start with why rather than with what. Most business owners, when they ask, what do you do? You say, oh, I do this. I create this widget. I, I make shoes, right? Uh, how do you do it? Oh, we have these processes. It's all natural, etc." And why do you do it? We want to make sure that people have the ability to be mobile and live good lifestyles. Versus, why do you do what we do? We want to, we've created a company that is dedicated to helping people stay in motion, stay healthy, and live the best version of their lives. How we do this is we use all natural ingredients and, and a process that is sustainable and good for the environment and good for our customers. What do we do? We sell shoes. Same story. Flipped in reverse, far more effective in the second where you start with why versus start with what. And all the best companies in the world, um, a Apple, Nike, IBM, all of them take this approach. And so then you become not just a customer, but a raving fan. So BizHack's why is that we champion the underdog so you can thrive. Whether you're a student or a business owner, we are here to help you make the most uh, of your life, of your career, of your business, so that you can do good for others. One of the things that we love is we vet every company we work with and make sure that they have a social mission, uh, that they're doing good in the world, so that when we help them succeed, our impact is all the customers that they gain to do their greatness. Our what is we do this uh, through um, content, coaching, and community. That's, that's the product. And our how is storytelling, strategy, and software. So you can see that our why is about championing the underdog. Our how is storytelling, strategy, and software. And then finally, the actual product, you know, the courses and the training, the content, the coaching, and the community, that's the last thing we get to, the last thing we talk about. So as I mentioned, there's this why chain exercise. What was your passion or purpose in starting the company? And it's really a, sim a, a set of questions. Why is it important? Why does this matter? What we have found is that when people go through this exercise, what they usually come to is a story from their childhood. Someone who taught them to value something that they now carry forward in their life. And so I'd invite all of you guys to think, what is your motivation for, you, you, you know, for your major, for the business that you run? Why do you do what you do? You have so many choices, so many choices about what you do in this world. Why did you choose that? Why was that the thing that you chose to do? So I'd invite you uh, to start sharing in the chat why you do what you do, what your personal motivation is for your company. Take a minute. Um, please uh, write what comes to, to mind, you know, start with just whatever's in your heart. What was your passion and purpose in starting this and, and, and who taught you to value that? And what I'm going to do is I'll share with you uh, a couple of examples that I hope you'll find inspiring uh, as you're thinking about your why. So um, as I mentioned, it's often an anecdote from your life. And then what you have to do is you have to connect the story of me, the personal reason that you do it with the story of us, which is what your customers are facing and looking to do. So I'm going to uh, share with you now while you're thinking about your own stories, uh, an example from Howard Schultz of Starbucks. This is a really beautiful example of uh, how um, you can use the story of me uh, in a business setting. So let me just call this up. My father was a uh, World War II veteran, high school dropout, and came back from the war with yellow fever and unfortunately ended up really not realizing the aspiration of the American dream he thought he was going to come home to after the war. He was a delivery driver picking up and delivering cloth diapers before the invention of Pampers. And in March of 1960, on a delivery, he fell on a sheet of ice and fractured his ankle and broke his hip. 
the injury caused him to get fired. No workman's compensation, obviously no health insurance. When I was seven years old, I literally came home from school, opened the apartment door, and saw my father laid out on a couch with a cast from his hip to his ankle. Listen, at the age of seven, how could I possibly understand the impact that would have on me? But it, it scarred me to watch and witness my parents and my mother just go through such a hard time. As I got older, I think I've always been... So I want to pause there for a sec, because right now we are talking about a guy who sells overpriced lattes. And when you look at the story that he's told so far about growing up poor and his dad breaking his hip, you might be like, what the heck does that have to do with Starbucks? And watch what he's able to do here in just a matter of a couple sentences, less than 30 seconds, about uh, less than 50 words, how he's able to connect that with the core values of a Fortune 100 company and take that story of me about growing up poor with a dad who gets injured and gets left behind and turns it into a story of us, which is the, the seed of what turned uh, you know, a single coffee shop in uh, Seattle into a global behemoth. Sensitized to people living on the other side of the tracks and as Starbucks evolved, I think I was trying to build the kind of company my father never got a chance to work for. A company that would try and balance profit with conscience. Notice his phrasing here. He wants to balance profit with conscience. I, I love that framing. I love that term. And honestly, who of us, who among us wouldn't want to create a company that balances profit with conscience? Um, I really encourage you guys to listen to this podcast. Uh, it's Masters of Scale. Um, and he talks a lot in this hour-long episode about how you build a company that balances profit with conscience. So it's not just enough to say, I have a vision or I have a value of doing this. He actually put it into practice through very specific policies and behaviors. But it all came back to that personal story that happened to him as a kid and then how this very talented communicator and CEO then communicated that uh, to his audience. So I see that a, f a couple of you are beginning to uh, share your stories of me. Thank you, Kathleen, uh, Brian, uh, Landon. Um, really appreciate that and keep them coming. Uh, it's for you that you're sharing your story because ultimately whatever you put out there, it's the starting point. It's the seed to something even better. Once you have your business story, you can put it on your Facebook business page. On, on business pages, they have an about section where you can tell the story of your business. You can put it on your LinkedIn profile. Before you get to your resume, you have a section where you can talk about your personal motivation for running your business. You can put it on your website in the form of a video or a, a little text like here. And uh, you can put it in business directories. Uh, we've created a business directory for all of the businesses that are part of the BizHack program. And we invite those businesses not to tell the story uh, of themselves but to t uh, not to tell the story of their products, but to tell their personal story and why they're motivated uh, to do what they do. So uh, I'll give you a few uh, examples of that while you guys are uh, sharing your own stories of me and stories of us uh, in the chat. So Gabriel Velez, uh, who is in the business directory, talked about when he was two years old, he lost his father and his little sister and was raised by his mother. And that, jo that gratitude that he feels for his mother is what has led him to create a line of candles and other products called Heaven of Joy that's specifically geared for women. So that's a really beautiful example of um, Gabriel giving back to his mother who raised him after the tragic death of his father and sister. 
Cristobal Giddy, who runs a karate studio, talked about how uh, his father um, taught him karate as a kid uh, back in their native Chile. They moved to the United States, and his dad started a karate dojo in near Miami. And then uh, Cristobal, when he was 28, his father called him. My father was dying of lung cancer, and he wanted me to take over the dojo. So Cristobal at that time was working at a server farm. He had no intention of doing karate. Karate was just something he kind of grew up around. And now suddenly he was being given this <coughs> kind of albatross, if you will, of taking over his dad's uh, karate dojo. And what you can see here is that Cristobal then st talked about how he now runs a karate studio with the values that his father taught him of an unbending will and an undying commitment to my students. And then he said, now more than ever, we need to train our bodies and minds to endure, and I am here to serve you. I, I love what he does here because he takes this story of being asked to take over something from his father when he was 28, and he's turned it into his life's mission to carry forward his dad's legacy moving forward. Are you noticing here how whether it's the founder of Starbucks who's talking about a lesson from his childhood that he's trying to counteract, the lesson of being abandoned by the business, he wants to create a business that has a conscience, to Cristobal taking his father's legacy and carrying it forward, to uh, Gabriel who's taking his mother and, and creating a business to, to pamper uh, mothers just like her. Another great example, we talked about shoes earlier today, Byron Kibbert uh, of the Runner's High, he sells high-end shoes for runners. A lot of people who run businesses like that, they're really about elite performance. Well, Byron's all about comfort. And I asked him, like, why do you run a comfort shoe store, not a elite performance shoe store? Even though you're a runner, you seem to be really interested in people with disabilities. And he said, well, my mother had a disability. She had multiple sclerosis, but she was a Mary Kay salesman and she would load her uh, wheelchair into the back of her car and she was the most successful Mary Kay salesperson in the entire region. And I said, well, let's connect that. Like, do you think it's an accident that you had a mother with a, mo uh, a movement disability and now you've run a store that caters to people with mo movement disabilities? And he's like, gosh, I had never thought about that. In 30 years running this business, he had never thought once about why he was running a comfort shoe store. I come across this all the time. And it makes me both, it's kind of like remarkable because I know I'm really providing incredible value when I'm able to help unearth the story, but it kind of mystifies me as well. Like, Byron, did you never stop and ask yourself, like, why am I running a shoe store? Like, why, is, why this of all the things? You know, why am I motivated to do this when it's really hard and it, and it, and it's, it can be really challenging work? And, uh, and he just, a lot of business owners are going so fast and working so hard, they don't stop to think about why they do what they do. And that's one of the things that um, I love to do the most as a storyteller, uh, a journalist, someone who has uh, studied this, is to really help business owners get in touch with their story. So I want to take a second and pause. We're not getting a ton of questions, although we are getting some people sharing. Um, thank you, Andrea Kirby, Steve Parks, Mary Simpson. Um, and, um, any, uh, I'm going to pause for a sec and I'm going to, before we go into the six pillars, uh, I'm going to invite any questions or any, um, comments that people have while I'm doing that. I'll also take a look at the stories of me you guys have shared. So Brian talks about serving in a godly way. Um, so good people do not get manipulated or taken advantage of by other businesses. So Brian, what I would encourage you to do is ask who taught you to serve in a godly way? Why do you feel it is your mission, both your business mission and your personal mission to um, help make sure that people don't get manipulated? Who taught you to value that? Was it a pastor? Was it a family member? Uh, was it something that happened in your life where you did get uh, taken advantage of and you want to make sure that others don't. So um, I would really encourage you to, to dig a little deeper and if you're willing, share it. Um, 
Landon talked about how I've always been amazed at how visual and auditory mediums can be used to deliver messages, um, whether they're grounded in reality or fiction. Uh, and I like to take on clients that allow me to make videos that tell stories or deliver messages that inspire or encourage people to become better versions of themselves. I think that's great, but Landon, I would push you to do the same thing, which is when did this love affair with visual and audio start? Most of us who are in love with that kind of thing can trace that back to our childhood. Did you make videos or, or audio as a kid? When did you discover your love for that? And why do you want to bring that to other people through your work? Um, Andrea said, I grew up seeing the hard work of my grandparents uh, that my grandparents put in their farm. Our organization stands up for and advocates for the industry my grandparents loved. We support agriculture and work for those who are out working hard in the field. Drop mic, Andrea. That's perfect. That's exactly what, what a story of me and a story of us should look like. And you can see how powerful that is. It's simple. It's short. But it immediately gives you credibility among people in your industry. My grandparents were farmers. I understand what it means to be a farmer. I'm going to serve you in, the, uh, in a farmer organization. Um, excellent. Uh, Steve and Mary, I don't think you're digging deep enough. Um, and so I would really encourage you to, to take another crack. At not, this is not your tagline for your business. This is not something to cut and paste from your website. This is really far more personal. Uh, and individual than that. And Brian talked about how uh, an 800 pound gorilla in the business market put me out of my first business by signing secret illegal bonuses to my competition. Uh, and they buried me in a million dollars in legal bills, pay family and realizing I was abusing my salesman gift for my gain rather than mutual gain. I love it. So it was really through terrible tragedy and misfortune that Brian had a kind of reawakening uh, as a business owner with a conscience. Uh, Landon says, growing up, I've had to deal with Asperger's, yet thanks to the support and encouragement of my mother and a team of people, um, I've been able to uh, not let my autism overtake me and transform myself into something of a functioning young adult. Uh, Landon, thank you for sharing that. It's really beautiful. And my understanding of um, folks with um, Asperger's is you often have some senses enhanced. And so what you might have found as you went as you grew up is that you know your disease uh, or your your um, Asperger's uh, challenged you in some regards and enhanced or gave you special skills in others. And you're now turning what has been a challenge into a gift that you can give to others. You know, that's the, that's the kind of taking the story of me and transitioning it into the story of us. Um, excellent. So let's go ahead and now to thank you guys. Uh, I really love kind of being in conversation with you via the chat. Uh, let's now talk about the six pillars. So the six pillars, as we mentioned, are objective audience offer, video message, and call to action. We're going to go through all of them now. We're going to use a Facebook ad as a learning tool. What we have found is that Facebook is a great place to get started in learning about digital marketing, just like learning ballet is a great place to get started with dance, and learning your scales on a piano is a great way to get started if you want to be a, a, flute, a flute player or play the guitar. So first, I want to make sure you all understand what an ad is on Facebook. And there are three types of uh, ways that you can, pr uh, you can kind of promote yourself on Facebook. There are actually more than three. But there's an organic post. That's a post that you put. It's like a status update. You do it for free. There's a boosted post where you take this, the organic post and you have it have larger reach. And then there's an ad which is built in a completely different section of Facebook. It's a completely different thing than an organic post and its boost. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking they've run ads on Facebook when really all you've done is boosted posts, and that is not an ad. So again, the organic post is, is just like a status update from your business page. The problem is nobody is seeing organic posts. Uh, back in 2012, about 
If you had 100 followers, about 16 of them on average would see your post. Today, that number is closer to two. So if you've noticed that when you post on Facebook, nobody likes or shares or reacts to it, it's because Facebook isn't showing it to anybody. Facebook has become a pay-to-play platform. So a lot of people take that and they just boost it. And all that boosting does is it gets you back to 2012. It gets you more reach. But a boost is not real, nearly as effective or powerful as an ad. You can see here in this column that ads do a heck of a lot more uh, than boosted posts. They give you a lot more power and they don't cost any extra. They're just, frankly, a little harder to do. Uh, a couple of the things that, that posts have, uh, the ads have that boosts don't is they have a call to action button. They actually allow you to have a short, punchy headline underneath the image, um, and they allow you for much more powerful targeting than what's allowed for in a boost. So now that we understand what a Facebook ad is as our learning tool, I'm going to then share with you the story of a dance studio, a Send Dance Studio, as we talked about earlier, that had then used Facebook ads to help drive new customers to their summer camp. So the Sandan Studios is run by Raphael and Valentina. Um, they are near Miami, Florida. It's for teenage girls, basically. And they're having a problem, which is their summer camp uh, was empty in the late summer. Uh, this is pre-COVID, uh, this case study, just so you know. Um, their enrollment in their summer camp uh, in late July and August was less than 50%. So what they were seeing is that people were signing up for the beginning weeks and then dropping off. So what we did is we worked with Ascendance to help them develop a multi-pronged strategy for driving more attendance at their dance camp. First thing is they created a free trial class called Move with the Minions. They offered, this is where like little Minions characters would be dancing along uh, with prospects and it was for free. Uh, they offered significant de discounts for people who bought multi-week packages. They promoted all of this on Facebook um, and their website. They ran Facebook ads. They ran Google ads. They had a referral program encouraging parents to send fr their, their kids with friends. And they started doing a lot on social media. Actually, back when they ran this, it was something called Musical.ly. It's now called TikTok. Uh, so they were basically encouraging kids to post on TikTok, the predecessor of TikTok, to help create FOMO uh, among 14-year-old girls. One thing you need to know about Facebook is you cannot run ads targeting people under age 18. So when they wanted to reach their ideal target audience of teenage girls, they had to use other mechanisms, in this case, musically, now known as TikTok. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at their Facebook ad campaign from the image of the six pillars starting with the campaign objective. Your objective when you're marketing online is to generate leads and a lead is an email and a cell phone number. So what you're really trying to do with all of your online marketing is get people to give you their contact information so you can follow up with them. Your objective is, that's called a lead. And you, the list of people who you have are your, is your prospect list. And this list of people uh, is incredibly powerful for a variety of reasons. Not only are these people who you can email uh, or you can call, but you can also upload this list of potential customers into Facebook, into Google, into LinkedIn, into TikTok, and then those platforms will match your prospect list with people inside of their system, and you can actually advertise, run targeted ads that specifically focus your prospects. This is called a custom audience in Facebook or a customer match audience in Google. So not only having their email address allows you to email them, it really unlocks the power of custom audiences when you're advertising. You can say, well, a lot of people don't pick up my phone calls anymore, and that's true as well. I've noticed actually 76%, uh, according to the data, of calls from an unknown number are not answered. But you can still text them. You can also WhatsApp them. WhatsApp is actually 50% larger than text message worldwide. So WhatsApp has become incredibly powerful as a marketing channel. And then because cell phone numbers rarely change, a lot of times people will attach a cell phone number to their Facebook account, and that allows Facebook to match the phone number to an advertising profile and allow you to advertise to them as well. So just to clarify, when you have a list of customers, emails, and phone numbers, and you upload that to Facebook, 
Facebook doesn't actually take that data. All they do is they use a system that matches it with their database of emails and phone numbers. And if there are any matches, they create what's called a custom audience based off of that. And then you can advertise to that custom audience. You're not actually giving away the private information of your customers. All you do is matching Facebook advertising profiles to your customer list. It's an incredibly powerful tool that many, many small businesses are using and you should use too. Now, when you're setting your campaign objective, it's another way of saying that is how do you measure the success of your campaign? And for me, when you're advertising, when you're running campaigns online, you should be able to draw a line between that activity and bottom line results. Um, the problem is there's so much data, it can be sometimes messy or muddy to make that attribution. And just in the case of Facebook, which is one of the examples we're talking about, there is four different data dashboards that live inside of Facebook that you can draw data from. Ads Manager, Facebook Insights, Facebook Analytics, and Events Manager. So no wonder so many of us feel overwhelmed by this information. And for many people, um, th this, is, this stops them from feeling like they're able to measure the success of their campaign. But really at a high level, if you are able to generate leads from your online activities, if you're able to convert them into sales, you're doing the right thing. And that is the ultimate measure of success. Now, when you're starting out a Facebook ad campaign, they invite you to choose a goal. And by choosing a goal, you're essentially setting the metric for that goal. Um, we recommend get more leads as an objective. It's a little bit more expensive than other objectives, but it will get you email addresses and phone numbers, which as we said, are marketing gold. The lead form that you get from a lead generation objective is actually built into the ad. So you get the ad and then you click and you get a form like this. And um, Facebook measures success. Well, we're going to skip this just for time reasons. Um, you guys will get these slides, by the way, and you can look at this material on your own time. Um, but there's a great example of how Facebook thinks about and measures its success. So the campaign objective uh, in this case was to get parents to buy a multi-week pack. Uh, and the way that they did that was to get them to either sign up for the, um, for the uh, trial or to call that phone number. So that was their campaign objective. Next is your target audience. When you're dealing with any advertising campaign, you cannot advertise to the whole world. You have to pick a, a set of your audience that you think uh, will be most receptive. And that's called uh, segmentation. And so the segmentation process is dividing up, divvying up your customers into different definable, findable, profitable, growth potential groups. And I add that you enjoy serving because if you're a business owner, what is the point of serving an audience that you don't enjoy? Another way to think about segmentation is there are four key questions you ask to help define your audience. Where, who, what, and why. Where do they live? Geographic. Who are they? Demographic. What do they do? Behaviors. And why do they do it? Psychographics. Facebook and Google have revolutionized this process of identifying your audience. We talk a lot about millennials and what you find is a lot of times we use broad brush um, descriptions. Millennials uh, are often hip annuals. We're, we're really thinking about the, I can make the world a better place hip annual, but there are actually six different types of millennials and the millennial mom and the old school millennial taken together the tech fearful old school millennial and the mom actually are larger than the population of hip annuals. So a lot of us have a misconception about who millennials are. And when you actually do the research, do the work and segment your audience, you actually will find that this is true about your customers as well. Uh, and you need to really understand your customer and most businesses, uh, small businesses don't. Once you have segmented your audience, you then need to target 
a segment of the audience, a specific group of the audience that's going to get you the best result. And here you want to look for what's known as the Goldilocks principle. You want to be specific, but not too specific so that they're too small an, uh, an audience. You want to be not too broad so that you're advertising to a dissolute group of people. You want to really find someone that's narrow. And so we use this example, which is imagine you own a golf retail store and you're trying to think about what interests to target. A lot of people who own a golf store would say, oh, let's target anybody who likes Tiger Woods or the PGA. The problem is, is that Tiger Woods is way too broad. There are lots of people who follow Tiger Woods who, you know, sadly was in a car accident this week, uh, and I hope for a fast recovery for him. Uh, but, you know, Tiger is somebody that I don't play golf, but I'm following, right? And so the fact that I'm interested in Tiger Woods, that I read an article about Tiger Woods, doesn't mean I'm a good prospect to buy a golf club or golf balls. So if you target people who've shown an interest on Facebook in Tiger Woods, you're wasting a lot of money. A much better campaign would be to target Bubba Watson. And if you're like me, you're like, who? Who is Bubba Watson? Well, for golf enthusiasts, he's the best left-handed shot maker in the history of golf. But for other normal people who don't play golf, they have no idea who he is. And so this, comes, this creates what we call the uh, but no one else would trick, which is a golf enthusiast would know who Bubba Watson is, but no one else would. So if you're looking to kind of I, target your ideal audience online, using this trick, this but no one else would trick, is a great way for you to identify the criteria by which you can use to find your ideal customer online. So in the case of um, Raphael and the Sendance Studios, their ideal customer persona is the dance mom. And these are the things uh, that um, concern the dance mom and are how to find the dance mom online. Next is an offer. So you've figured out what your objective is. You've figured out who your audience is. Now you need to come up with an irresistible offer. And the pointy-headed uh, professors of marketing will say that the definition of marketing is a process to obtain what you want by creating, offering, and exchanging products of value. The offer is the core. It's essential to marketing. And when we talk about an offer, we really think about an incentive to get customers and prospects to stay in touch and make a purchase. And your marketing must answer the questions, what are you offering me? How much? What's in it for me? And why should I believe you? And if you don't have an offer that answers these questions, the sale will not close. There's a great concept that I love, which is called the irresistible offer. That's an offer that's so good, you'd be a fool to pass it up. There's a whole book by Mark Joyner about the topic. BizHack's irresistible offer is that we have a course that pays for itself. When people take our course, they make more money and they, they pay off the tuition often before graduation day. So if you want to raise awareness about your product or your business, often it requires a free irresistible offer. The idea is that you want to inspire a prospect to share their contact information. So if you were to put a price on this offer, would someone pay me for it? So I want to invite, I'm going to give you guys some examples of free irresistible offers. Those could be a discount, uh, a gift, a white paper, a quiz or survey, um, a live event or webinar, a recorded lesson. This is a free irresistible offer as well. Uh, you guys have come here. I'm giving this free of charge. It's a community service. I'm hoping you're getting value out of it. And some of you will uh, potentially uh, apply to be in our program. Uh, we'll stay in touch and be, join our BizHack Live. We'll become part of our community. And so this is uh, our free irresistible offer is free high quality information that makes you want more. So there are different offers for different stages. Uh, there's the um, irresistible offer, that free irresistible offer that you start with. We call it the foot in the door offer, which is like once you've expressed interest, how do we get you to actually make your first purchase? Then there's the upsell offer in which you're actually trying to take an existing customer and sell, have them buy again. And for the free irresistible offer for Ascendant Studios, was a mini dance camp for free move with the minions. It was a great concept, um, use, you know, leveraging the, the minions 
uh, popularity and a free class. Who's going to turn that down? Now, the vernacular of online is video, and this the thumb stopping video means that when you're scrolling on your mobile phone on Facebook, everybody, almost everyone consumes Facebook using their mobile phone and they're scrolling down it. And then when they see something that interests them, they stop. That's a thumb stopping video. And so you want to make sure that your um, video, which, which is going to be more effective than a still image in most cases, is thumb stopping. It gets people to stop, pay attention, and look. Now, these videos that you use in ads are much shorter than what you're probably imagining. They're often as short as 12 seconds. Uh, we don't recommend you hire a videographer for these. Your aim should be to get a video and put it together in 30 minutes or less, and to try stuff out with this video and test different videos. Now, how do you create a video in under 30 seconds? Well, we have a number of tech tools that you can use that allow you to essentially create a little, basically like a slideshow, uh, but it is a video. Um, so an example of a slideshow creator is Lumen5. It's free for their demo version and we highly recommend it. Uh, all of our students use it, lumen5.com. There's another great tool, which is for graphic, to turn you into a graphic designer called Canva. And one of the things that Canva does is it allows you to build videos simple short videos in there as well. And then inside of Facebook itself in their business manager, they have something called the video creation kit. And here you can see is the video creation kit for, for Facebook, where you can actually build a video directly inside of Facebook that you wanna use in your ad. And you can see that they're, they give you templates and their recommendation is six to 15 seconds, you know, two to seven images. So it's really short, just a few images with some text. It's not that hard to do. So here is the thumb stopping uh, video and then the compelling message, uh, move with the minions and the minions go go uh, goggle giveaway. So the compelling message is really about how do you grab people's attention with a few words of text. People's attention is just getting pulled in so many different directions and you need to be where they are and relevant to them. And so the compelling message is a way for you to help your user discover relevant content and help them with their needs. Finally, the call to action. The call to action is that little button that gets them, that kicks them to the next stage in their journey. And so the call to action is often like learn more or sign up or register now. It's a little piece of text, but it's probably the single most important uh, text in all of marketing. And I love the call to action idea because your marketing should be about motivating people to do something. And that something is to go to your landing page, to go to your website, to email you back, to take your test, to download your ebook, to visit your store, to make your purchase, to tell a friend. Those are examples of calls to action. And this whole process, these six pillars, really is a cycle because you started, remember, with your campaign objective and you're ending now with your call to action. What is it that you want them to do to continue their journey with you? The call to action really helps highlight this idea that a Facebook ad alone is not going to actually lead to a purchase. Rather, it's the kicking off point of a journey that could include going to a web page, getting a thank you email, uh, having them then visit your website, maybe search you on Google or Yelp, then finally making that purchase. So this is what we in marketing call the customer journey. And there can be many touch points on that journey. So as we said, a Facebook ad kicks off the journey and it ends with either a sale or a no thank you. And then what goes on in between is that messy middle. And every business should have some kind of perspective on what that ideal customer journey looks like. And then what happens after that first sale, the upsell can also be messy. There might be different products or services, and there might be a whole nother journey that they have to go through to get to them. No one ever said marketing is simple. Uh, we try to keep, kind of boil it down to its essence, but it is a time-consuming process if you want to do it right. So if you want to get started 
uh, in building your customer journey, you want to identify the individual touch points that a persona, that an ideal customer would make before a purchase, and really map out all of the different interactions, whether it's visiting your website, opening an email, or, what, or, or filling out a form. And just document all of that, and then make sure that every step in that process is as smooth as possible for your user. So in this case, there were actually two calls to action. There was a sign up, uh, which is the button. They also invited them to click and call. And then finally, to get this six pillar process and implement it for your company, there are, there's a nine step process to actually put it in place. It starts with creating your customer persona and building audiences, then you create your video, then you launch your first ad, then you map out the customer journey, you determine a free irresistible offer, you analyze the results of that first ad, you then build a lead form or a landing page to collect leads, you launch a second ad for lead generation, and then you analyze and optimize the second ad. That nine-step process is what we work with uh, our paid participants in the nine classes, each class roughly corresponding to one of the steps in the process. This is the most essential, this is the essence of, of digital marketing. And it's not simple. And oftentimes, business owners, marketing professionals really need hand, their hand held the first time that they run through this. But honestly, once you've done this uh, and you've practiced this and you've gone through the nine-step process, it's much easier to then do it again or hire someone to do it for you. Um, and it's much, much easier for you to then understand the work that's being done on your behalf, set it up against this, this process and make sure that you're getting your money's worth for your marketing spend. So what were the results for Sendan Studios in doing this? Well, they followed our uh, lead building system. They increased the fill rate from 60% the prior summer to 80%. They had enrollment up 50%. Their idle capacity in later summer was down 40%. They enrolled, 20% uh, of people enrolled in six or more weeks. That was compared to just 9% the year before. And they doubled their revenue, 90% increase in revenue to nearly 40,000 from 20,000. These are the bottom line results that businesses that systematically go through our process, our system, very often get. So... Uh, the next steps are, and uh, if you want, Heather, to put the links back in the chat again, we do offer a scholarship for uh, minority and women-owned businesses. Uh, I would strongly encourage you to apply. Um, I'm going to go ahead and extend that scholarship, which is a partial scholarship, um, to anybody who's here today. So if you uh, want to apply for the scholarship um, and, and, uh, and you're here today, uh, we will honor that for you. Um, if you want to chat with me about the program um, or any other marketing challenges you might have, you can go to my Calendly link, calendly.com slash bizhack slash apply, and go ahead and schedule a meeting with me. I'm happy to ha chat with you, help you in whatever way I can. And then finally, uh, every week on a Wednesday, we have a uh, live webinar on some topic in digital marketing for businesses, and I would encourage you uh, to join us for that. Those of you who, when you were registering, said that you wanted to stay informed uh, about uh, upcoming events, you will be getting emails about our BizHack Live. Um, those of you who opted out of that but still want to participate, check out bizhack.com and sign up. Um, I'm actually going to be doing an encore presentation of this presentation on Wednesday. So if there's anybody you know you think would benefit from it, Please have them sign up uh, for next Wednesday's Lead Building System webinar. Um, and uh, I want to um, uh, end with this parting thought, which is um, the term crisis in Chinese uh, has two characters, one that represents danger and the other that represents opportunity. In this time of COVID, all of us are very aware of the danger. Uh, people are dying. We just eclipsed half 
a million, which is just an ungodly number. Many small businesses are dying as well. Well more than 100,000 small businesses have closed permanently due to this pandemic. For those of us still standing, there is also opportunity. And in a crisis, we all are focused on the danger. We're not always as focused on the opportunity, the opportunity to serve people, um, to do good, to make the world a better place, to help people through COVID. I know personally uh, with BizHack, uh, I am on a, I'm on fire right now. I'm on a mission to make sure that every business is um, that, that, that can survive, does survive. And we are working with hundreds of small business owners, many of you uh, here to make sure that you can survive and thrive despite the challenges uh, of COVID-19. And so my message to you as we wrap up is please grasp the opportunity. I hope to see you guys. Uh, I hope many of you apply for a scholarship. Would love to have you. I hope to also see you at our weekly BizHack Lives. Thank you so much, Marietta College, for this opportunity to present to your audience. And I, uh, I applaud you in your entrepreneurial um, a workshop. Thank you, Dan. That was wonderful, as you are seeing from our comments already. Thank you for everybody who attended. Uh, please check out the links. Make sure you're following Dan and trying some new things with your work. Not that you have enough in your life going on. We appreciate all of your time and attention and hope to see you at future uh, Mid-Ohio Valley Entrepreneurship Expo events. Yeah, thank you so much, Landon and Gina and Catherine, Seth, Brian, Claire, Mary. Uh, really appreciate your guys' interest. Um, I just threw in the chat, um, if you guys want to schedule a call with me to chat about anything marketing related or anything business related, business owner to business owner, uh, happy to chat with you anytime. I do also encourage you, uh, if you scroll up a little bit more, to apply for a scholarship if you do think that this program might be beneficial to you. Heather, what's coming up next in your program? We have the Pio Biz competition coming up for Marietta College students and recent alumni who have entrepreneurial ideas and get to present them to the audience. And if any of today's attendees happen to attend on March 11th at 4.30, they would actually get to not only hear the students' ideas, but vote on which ones they think uh, are the best. Awesome. And uh, we just had a question from Seth asking, are BizHack Live webinars free and open to the community? And yes, they are. They're part of the community service that we're providing. We started them uh, during COVID. We've had more than 2,000 individuals attend. We've held more than three dozen sessions. We were recognized with the Global Campaign of the Year by the American Marketing Association. And it's really all about us kind of fulfilling our mission to help the underdog thrive. Um, and uh, we know that not all of you uh, are able to or ready to, to, to do the, the paid program with the implementation, uh, but you do want to learn more about marketing, and so we're here to help support you in that. Um, and yes, Nat, the slides will be uh, provided to Heather and then shared uh, with all of you participants uh, who registered, um, and uh, you should see that email. When, when roughly, I'll be sending that to you shortly. Heather, when roughly do you expect that email to go out? If not by the end of this week, then next week. Okay, great. Um, and, you know, I encourage you guys to follow BizHack. You know, we have a lot of great content on our YouTube channel. Uh, really appreciate your time, your interest. And uh, thank you again, Heather uh, and Jacqueline, um, for your uh, participation. Um, Jacqueline, I don't know if you're there, but I did have a quick question for you. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Jacqueline. <laughs> I, I, I had to call you out. So I know you participated in a five-week program that we did uh, with the village of Pinecrest, which is a municipality near Miami. Um, just curious from you, any, um, any feedback on how that helped you with your work uh, supporting entrepreneurs and businesses? This really has to sink then, right? <laughs> uh, so every time I watch you and I, every time I attend one of your workshops, I pick up, there's like tons of information, but uh, I, I, I have, to, I've been taking notes here. <laughs> I pick, I pick up one or two things. 
to talk. Uh, and of course, our program is not a business or is not for profit business. So we have to kind of translate your your uh, ideas into what works for us. So I was thinking about what is our story and, and I was kind of were, uh, you know, thinking along those lines and uh, definitely uh, things that you're saying, it's, uh, it's applicable, not just to businesses, uh, also people, you know, because we are also in the business of selling ourselves in a way, uh, right? And, and, and so what is our story? Why am I working for Marietta College? And why am I running this program? What is the ultimate goal? And where does this come from? So really, I'm uh, you make me think every time I watch you. Let me tell you that much. You really right. make me think. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you for much. sharing that. I love oh, yeah, you're welcome. And I'm curious, um, what did you get? What were your ahas today? You know, what, one of the things that we measure as our North Star, uh, that, uh, that in our magic moment, like what we like to say at BizHack is we deliver more ahas per minute than any of the competitors. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to pack in as much insight as possible. Um, and what that means is a lot of people watch and then rewatch our sessions because there's just so much density in there. So today, what was like one or two of your biggest ahas that you can apply maybe to your work? The ahas actually um, um, taking me back to my own childhood, as you said, the why, 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 why question. And um, and I'm still digging further uh, to see where does my motivation come from? Why am I doing what am I doing again? I guess that's the aha thing. And, and, and as you mentioned to some of our, um, you know, uh, attendees, you know, uh, when you first uh, present that to us, we don't take it deep enough. You know, every time I watch you, I kind of, oh, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to answer another why. Another, it's like peeling the onion, right? It's just another why, another why. And it's really, it's an aha moment for me. And I'm, uh, and another aha moment I had is that um, this really applies, as I said, not just to businesses. I mean, right now, you know, we have a department. We are we are working on uh, maybe uh, revisiting our mission and vision and all that stuff. And I'm thinking, wow, this uh, this is what we should do. We should really think along those lines and find our whys and uh, what our purpose. And start with why, and then go with what, right? Why, how, and what? That was another aha moment. <laughs> I had several. <laughs> very, very well said. You know, I, uh, I really applaud. Uh, those are those are two really profound ahas. Um, you know, I, as I said, I think really understanding why you do what you do is essential to living the best version of your life. And it just happens to be a great marketing tactic as well. But I feel like if you understand why you're doing what you're doing, and if you communicate that in a compelling way, it's very hard for me to imagine you won't succeed. Um, and I think what I have found is that people who are out of touch with their why, who do work that isn't meaningful to them, uh, they often find themselves in midlife kind of burning out. You can kind of only sustain that for so long. Um, and even the most disciplined, you know, I went to Princeton and I met all sorts of people who were so disciplined, who had been on the straight and narrow their whole lives. And, you know, now in our forties, they're kind of looking at their life and they're asking like, what the heck am I doing? How did I get here? Why did I do this path? Um, and I feel like if you're in touch with your why, you never have that horrible midlife crisis that so many of my classmates are having. Well, I um, passed my, my midlife, Dan, so. <laughs> I would never know looking at you. Um, the other thing I would say is that COVID has really forced a lot of us to really dig deeper. Um, and this is something I'm absolutely seeing. You know, we're getting a lot of businesses that cater to self-discovery, that cater to business coaching. The, the coaching industry is booming right now because a lot of people are asking the really hard questions. And so um, it's, there, there's never a bad time to analyze and 
contemplate why you're doing what you're doing. But I will say that when the economy is not going well, and maybe you're underemployed or unemployed, that often is the opportunity. If you, if you really grasp it, there's an opportunity in that. Like you finally have the time to really ask yourself the hard questions. I would also strongly encourage students to work on this, those of you who are still uh, online. Um, really understanding what you want to do, what your values are, and then building that into your interviews so that you're interviewing the company and saying, here's what I value. Do you value that too? Here's what I'm good at. Would you value that in me? And if there's just not a culture fit, if their values don't fit yours, you really shouldn't, shouldn't go for that job. We, we, we can aspire to something bigger. Um, thank you again so much for the time and for the, uh, the little conversation towards the end. I know we've run out of time. Yes. Uh, Heather, anything you wanted to add before we wrap up? No, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. I just want to remind everyone, we will, we will send you, as Heather said and Dan said, we, we will send you, actually, uh, this is going to be uploaded to our YouTube too, uh, to you, our YouTube channel, and, uh, and also we will send you the uh, PDF version of the slides, right, Dan? Absolutely. I'll we be getting that do, shortly. We will do that. Thank you so much, Dan. We appreciate it. And everyone, have a good evening. Thanks, Heather. Sorry. I didn't mean to come in front of camera. See you. <laughs> <laughs> and just an answer to your question, Catherine, yeah, all the BizHack lives on Wednesdays are on our YouTube channel. Thanks, everybody. Be well.